Job chapter 1. Tonight we're going to, uh, miracle of miracles, finish this chapter. So uh, verses 6 all the way to verse 22, God willing. And um, let's pray. God, we love you so much. Father, we want to thank you. We want to thank you tonight for your word. We thank you, God, tonight for your truth. And God, we know this evening is your word itself declares that the truth sets us free. And God, that you bring us wisdom and clarity, a firm footing for our lives through your word. And tonight I pray, God, that our study of your word this evening would be no different, that you would bring that clarity, God, that you'd bring that strength. Father God, that we would find ourselves standing upon the solid rock of your word especially for those of us who find ourselves in difficult and challenging times and confusing circumstances and struggling, God, maybe even bearing questions about you and about your attitude towards us. I pray this evening that your word would help us to understand even our own lives, our own circumstances. And Father God, in those areas where we never will be able to fully understand, where uh, questions will remain unanswered. I pray especially in those areas that we would be drawn to a place of worship and that we would humble ourselves before you and demonstrate our trust in you by submitting to your will. And so, Father, tonight we pray that you would mercifully minister to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, remember last week as we had uh, a short and brief introduction to this book, I mentioned a couple things about the significance or the greatness of this book, and uh, I shared with you some quotes from secular scholars and uh, writers and uh, poets about how amazing this book is, even from their perspective, and certainly remember we talked about its composition. It's a great book when you consider its composition. Uh, in the original language, of course, we know it's written in Hebrew poetry, uh, which for us, you know, when we think of poetry, we think of rap, right? Something that's got meter, it's got rhyme, it's got rhythm, uh, but it is not the case in Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry is uh, more centered around comparison and contrast. There's amazing parallelism and certainly extraordinary dialogue in this book. And in fact, the first dialogue begins, and the two characters in the dialogue are God and Satan. And so, uh, that in itself provides some interesting material for us to consider. But not just composition, but history as well. Remember, I mentioned to you that uh, outside of the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, this is the oldest portion uh, with respect to chronology of Scripture that we have available to us. Some people believe that Job was a contemporary of Abraham, which would place the circumstances, the history of this book around 2000. Uh, B.C., uh, and certainly that is a possibility. Not only from a biblical perspective would that mean that this is one of the oldest portions of Scripture that we deal with, uh, but then we would also understand that it's also from a secular perspective one of the oldest books, uh, one of the oldest writings uh, ever written. And so not only in history is that significant, but also thematically when you think about the theme, when you think about the question, when you think about the substance of the book of Job, we're dealing with one of the age-old questions that still plagues many people today, and that's the issue of pain and suffering. That's the issue of personal misery. It's the question that often is posed by the secular mind, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? Now, we talked about that a little bit last week, that that question in and of itself is problematic because from a biblical perspective, you know, being born-again believers, we know that inherently there's a problem philosophically with that question because there are no good people. And really, the question for us should be, why do good things happen to bad people? Since all, right? Right. right. <laughs> you don't get much of an amen on that when you preach that. But the reality is this, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, you know? And as a pastor, as a leader, spiritually, I'm telling you that I'm no different than you are, all right? We're all the same. We're all sinners. We're all sinners in need of a Savior, uh, when God looks down upon humanity, he doesn't see the haves and the have-nots. He doesn't see the good boys and the bad boys, the good girls and the bad girls. He just sees uh, have-nots. He sees bad boys. He sees bad girls. He sees people in need. And the glory of the gospel is this. Thinking about the time of the year, God didn't leave us in that condition. 
You know, the, the goodness of God is this, that God didn't leave us in a position where we were saviorless, where he just cast us off and, you know, uh, left us without hope for redemption. This is the glorious message of Christmas, not that uh, we get lots of goodies under the Christmas tree, you know, not that people cook us uh, cookies for Christmas and we get to gain five pounds in the month of December. You uh, understand why there's a New Year's resolution always about losing weight in January? Because you and I have stuffed our stinking face for 31 straight days. And so, you know, we think, how can I, how can I lose this? But that obviously is not the point of Christmas. The point of Christmas is the gift that was given, the redemption that God has provided, the Savior that God has sent. God sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. And so the reality is this. Uh, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's a miracle that God allows any goodness. It's a miracle that God allows blessing. God causes his reign to shine on the just and on the unjust. The theme of this book is really that God providentially allows affliction in the lives of his children for his glory, all right? And that's a difficult one for you and for me to swallow. We're going to talk about that theme. And, and truly, you know, it takes a mature believer in Jesus Christ to fully understand that and live that out. Uh, because we want, we want a reason. We want to have understanding. We live in an age where we've idolized understanding. And a lot of times, we won't move forward in faith. We won't bless God. We won't trust God until we, in our own minds, understand why we're going through what we're going through. And the reality is this, is there are some things we go through in life that we will never understand. We'll never have the answer to this side of heaven. And the beauty of our relationship with the Lord is often demonstrated when in those times we can still bless his name, where we can be at peace knowing that God providentially will allow affliction in our lives so that even through our tragedy, even through our tribulation, even through our personal suffering, he might be glorified. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, when we're settled with that, when we're willing to undergo affliction so that even in our suffering, God might be manifested, God might be glorified, man, what an amazing place that is to be. You know, our Hope chaplains have the opportunity of seeing that all the time when they're in the hospital ministering to brothers and sisters uh, who are suffering from various diseases, and to be in a place in a hospital bed where you are suffering physically, and to still give glory to God certainly is a testimony to the lost. But notice what happens here in verse 6 of chapter 1, the book of Job. And remember, the framework of this scenario is that this man is going to begin to experience circumstances that were not related to his personal sin. He was righteous in all of these things. Notice verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. So we're immediately, remember, we've talked about already uh, in the first five verses, we've been set up. We've, we've discovered how uh, immensely wealthy this man Job was, right? He had the house, he had the yacht, he had uh, the flat screen televisions, he had a fat old 401k program. I mean, he was, in, you know, in modern terms. In those days, he had camel, he had donkey, he had oxen, he had, he had all, all, the, all the Old Testament goodies that would make a man rich. In fact, he was so rich, the Bible says that he was the wealthiest of all the men of the East. He had not only these amazing possessions, but he also was blessed with children. And we talked a little bit last week about how children are a blessing. Even if you don't feel that way tonight, your kids are a blessing. And they're a heritage from the Lord. And in fact, uh, the fruit of the womb, we talked about not the fruit of the loom, but the fruit of the womb is a reward from the Lord. So if you've got kids, man, you've been rewarded by God. And that's the way the Bible presents it in the first five verses of the book of Job. Not only that, but we saw this man was a spiritual man. He was a leader. He loved the Lord. He prayed for his kids. He had a family altar. He interceded for them. He cared about their spiritual well-being. Well, now we're drawn into this 
heavenly intrigue, right? The, the scene goes from planet Earth to the throne room of God. And on this particular day, there were not only the sons of God that came to present themselves before God, but Satan also came with them. Now, when the Bible says the sons of God, remember in the Old Testament, when that phrase is used, predominantly it refers to the angelic beings, never to fallen angelic beings, which we would call in the New Testament demons, but to unfallen angelic beings, those who did not leave their former estate, those who continued to worship God. And, and so on this particular day, and, and you know, in contrast to the New Testament, where that phrase, the sons of God, is used for the children of God. On this particular day, the sons of God, the angelic host, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came with them. Now, the Bible is clear. Satan is a literal being. I know that there are many people out there that would love to kind of uh, falsely create this idea that Satan is a mythical figure, that, you know, he's really just a literary figure, not a literal figure, uh, and certainly we see that in our culture. Our culture kind of makes fun of believers, Orthodox Christians, for believing that there is a literal figure, a literal personage, personage known as, as Satan. But the Bible's clear. The Bible presents Satan, the adversary, and there are a variety of different names for Satan. Uh, he's called the devil. He's called the serpent of old. Uh, he is called the, de the, the tempter. He is called the deceiver. He is the deceiver of nations. Uh, the word or the name Satan is used more in the book of Job than any other book in the Bible. It, it occurs about 11 times. And the word means accuser. The word means adversary. In fact, in the original language, the definite article is included so when the name Satan is used, it, in the literal Hebrew, it is the adversary, the, the enemy, the one who opposes. And God addresses Satan, and he says, from where do you come? Now, God knows, right? I mean, this isn't like Q&A time. Hey, man, haven't seen you around here for a while. What's happening? Where you been? Not that I've missed you or anything like that, but, but what's been going on? God knows all that. God's giving an opportunity for this dialogue to begin, and Satan's response is this, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. So Satan relates his position. Now, just a, a little bit about Satan. Remember, at this point, he's been cast down. Why is he on the earth? Why is he walking to and fro on the earth? Because his position is radically changed. Listen, his name wasn't always Satan. His name used to be Lucifer. Right? He was the star of the morning. He was a beautiful creation of God. He was the anointed cherub. He had an exalted position in the throne room of God. His, his timbrels, the Bible says, were the workmanship of God himself. And some people believe uh, from that particular verse, uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28 is where we get a, a lot of our understanding about this particular being. A lot of people believe from that phrase uh, we have the idea that Satan at some point, Lucifer at that time, was the worship leader. He was kind of conducting the service uh, for the angelic host, uh, for the Lord. And he was lifted up. In Isaiah chapter 14, there are five I will statements concerning Satan. D at that point, Lucifer, he had in his mind this desire to become like the Most High God, and so he wanted to ascend. He wanted to be the focal point of worship and adoration. The Bible says that in the day he was made, he was made perfect, but there was corruption within him. There was pride that was within him, and it became evident as he not only exalted himself against uh, the Lord, but he drew a third of the angels with him, Revelation chapter 12 tells us. Now, you know, God is the perfect leader, you know, God, you can't think of a greater scenario to be in, a more functional scenario to be in, a more beautiful and amazing scenario to be in, and yet God himself experienced rebellion. And, you know, we on this earth, either as parents, as leaders, as employers, when we have positions of authority, oftentimes we experience rebellion, oftentimes we 
uh, experience uh, adversarial situations. Oftentimes we experience betrayal. Listen, it's not always because we've erred. God himself experienced it. So did Jesus Christ. I can't think of a more amazing ministry to be a part of than the ministry of the Lord, and yet the Lord had his betrayer as well. An amazing scenario, and yet Satan was exalted in his own personal pride. For us, a warning about the dangers of pride. And of course, Jesus relates the story himself. He said, I was there on that day. I saw Satan. Remember when uh, Satan came against God with a third of the angels? It wasn't that God had to even get up off of his throne. It wasn't that God looked at Gabriel and Michael and said, man, you guys, what are we going to do about this? This is, a, this is a tough one. He just spoke the word, and Jesus said, I saw him fall like lightning from heaven 186,000 miles per second. So just a little personal note, don't exalt yourself against the Lord, right? He stands as kind of an eternal uh, memorial for that. But he says this, his position's changed. He's been cast down. He's experienced uh, the consequence of his own pride. Maybe in addition to that, as he makes this statement, I'm walking to and fro on the face of the earth, maybe in addition he's uh, kind of expressing his dominion. His newfound dominion, remember with me in Genesis chapter 3, when Eve was deceived and Adam sinned, they gave authority and dominion that God had given them for the earth over to Satan. And so this may be kind of a statement of his personal dominion over the earth. He's called the God of this age. He's called the ruler of the world. He's called the prince of the power of the air. And the whole world, 1 John says, chapter 5, the whole world lies under his sway. Satan is a real being. He's a real adversary. And his desire, just as his desire for Job, his desire is to undermine everything that is God-glorifying. We're going to see three things that he does in the life of Job this evening. We're going to see that he stalks Job, he accuses Job, and he attacks Job. Now, I think, this is my personal opinion, I think that when God says, you know, hey, where you been, what you been up to, I think God knew exactly what was on his mind. And in a way, he, Satan, seeks to conceal it. Satan says, well, you know, I've just been hanging out on planet Earth, Walking to and fro, really not doing much of anything. And I think God draws something out here. Notice what the Bible says in verse 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and up upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So the Lord responds to Satan saying, by saying, Have you considered? Now that word is very interesting. It means to set your heart on something. And I, this is my personal opinion. I think that Satan had his eye on Job, all right? I think, you know, and especially as God says, have you checked out my servant, Job? You know, that he's unique. There's no one else like him on the face of the earth. He loves me, man. He is serving me. He shuns evil. I think every single one of those words was like a knife to the devil, right? Because he had his eye on Job. He'd been watching carefully his desire was to undermine and destroy Job, and it had been the whole time. He hated the fact, and we're going to see this later, that this man stood for righteousness. He hated the fact that this man honored God with his life. He hated the fact that this man was benevolent, and he loved to give generously not only his goods and possessions to other people, but also the wisdom of God. Hey, listen, the devil hated it. And the devil hates you for it as well. As you stand as a monument to the righteousness of God and the handiwork of God and the miracles of God, let me tell you something. The devil can't stand it. He liked it better when you were in his camp. He liked, and now that you've put your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I know this isn't one of the uh, promises that you want to hold on to, now that you've put your trust and faith in Jesus, you've got a target on you. You've been targeted by the devil. You've been targeted by his minions. Everything that is God-glorifying in your life, everything that brings attention to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is his personal desire to undermine all of that. I think that he had in his mind a desire to undermine Job. I think he was, in a sense, stalking Job. You know, we, we have uh, two dogs now, and one is a Cocker Spaniel. His name's Hampton. 
And Hampton's the sweetest, nicest, most loyal dog you could ever imagine, all right? I mean, if you come over to the house, uh, he's going to be so excited to see you, he might leave you a little present on your pant leg, okay? And I'm serious. Like, we've been trying to get this under control, but we can't. And I think that he would do that even if you were coming to steal something. This is how nice the dog is, which is, you know, nice, but not nice at the same time because I need a dog that's going to protect my family. And so I said to Rachel, I'm a big dog guy, right? I mean, I like big dogs. I, I acquiesced to my kids uh, a couple years ago and got them this little cocker spaniel. And, you know, it's not, you know, not my kind of dog, but whatever. The kids are happy with him, and I like him too. But I'm a big dog guy, so I said, babe, you know what? We need a, I'm gone so much, I want a dog that if someone jumps the fence, they're going to leave something in the yard before they jump back over the fence. And so, should I have said that out loud? Probably not. But, so I said, why don't we get a Rottweiler? And uh, she's like, yes, and the kids are yes, and maybe some of you have seen Boston. I brought him, uh, that's the name of our dog. Uh, surprise, surprise. I brought him to the church. The cutest little Rottweiler man you'd ever want to see. And this guy, he opens up his mouth, he's got like rows of teeth. Uh, this is my kind of dog, you know what I'm talking about? He's already bigger than Hampton. We've had him for, I don't know, maybe four weeks. Bigger than Hampton, stronger than Hampton, and immediately started stalking Hampton. Poor little Hampton, right? I mean, we bring this dog home, and I mean, it is immediate assertion of alpha dog. This little puppy, I didn't even know puppies had it in them so young. This little guy, man, he saw Hampton, and his chest went out, his legs got bent, his ears went up, and he just watched for the perfect moment to pounce on poor little Hampton. And so now what does Hampton do? Hampton uh, has to stay upstairs because if he comes downstairs, he is a victim, right? It is like Boston just chases him around and chomps on his floppy ears, you know, the God-given big old fat ears that he has. They just become, they're like little slices of meat, little sirloins for Boston to bite into. And Boston is like a roaring lion seeking Hampton because he wants to devour him. And it's sad, okay? Pray for poor little Hampton. (laughs) But listen, the devil is stalking as well. The Bible says be sober and vigilant because Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He stalks. He watches. He's patient. He's looking for a crack. He's looking for a crevice. He's looking for a weakness. He's looking for in you a willingness to to compromise, to even make the smallest decision so that through that small crack, through that small compromise, as you acquiesce to some temptation, he can gain a greater foothold in your life. Let me tell you something. He is patient, and he wants to undermine every good thing that God is doing in your life. God says of Job, have you considered my servant? By the way, this is one reason why I don't want to live too righteously in my life because I don't, no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Could you imagine like Job knowing that God said that? Hey, have you checked out my servant Job? I'd be like, time out, man. Lord, you know, just uh, can't you pick somebody else? Praying for you guys that God would esteem you so much that He would say that about you, consider my servant. Uh, And yet in all of it, God had a plan. He says in verse 9, so Satan answering, the Lord said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. Now listen, and he will surely curse you to your face. So listen, Satan couldn't deny it. All that God said about Job, have you considered my servant? Have you considered his righteousness? Have you considered his righteous living? Have you considered how he excuse evil, right? He shuns it. And Satan couldn't say, well, you know what, that's not true, because it was true of Job. He was a godly man. So what does Satan go after? Satan goes after his motivation. Satan accuses Job and accuses God all in one. He says, listen, the reason that Job loves you is because you blessed him. 
The only reason that Job serves you, the only reason that Job uh, orders his life in righteousness and not evil is because you've hedged him in, because you've blessed him. He just loves you because of what you've given him. He says, if you take that away, if you strip that away from him, he won't love you anymore. In fact, he will curse you to your face. He accuses Job of having ungodly motivations. Now, I just want to ask the question tonight, why do we love God? Why do we love him? Why do we obey him? Why do we choose to walk in righteousness? Uh, Is it because of the blessings that God gives us? Is it because of the possessions that he affords us? Is it only in times where he insulates us and hedges us from difficulty and circumstance and trial? And listen, before you answer tonight, before you answer, I, I just want all of us to think it through. Because a lot of times the reality of our own motivation is revealed when things are stripped away. A lot of times the reality of our own motivation is revealed when that hedge is taken away. You know, when we walk through fiery trials and difficulty, the real motivation, and I think this is significant for our Christian culture, because there are many elements out there in Protestant Christianity that say, well, you know, this is what God's plan for your life is. His plan is health, wealth, and prosperity. And if we begin to just connect our relationship with God and our desire to love Him and serve Him and obey Him, if we begin to connect that solely to what we can get from Him, is that really love? Is that really love in the first place? You know, it's difficult to even know the motivations of our own heart. I want to warn you about something here. Satan here is the accuser of Job. He accuses Job's motivation. Be careful about finding yourself in a position where you set yourself up as the judge of other people's motivations. You know, only the Lord has the ability to see into another man's or another woman's heart. We don't have that vision. We don't have that clarity. Only God knows the motivation of the heart. The reality is this. Oftentimes, we don't even know the motivation of our own heart. Paul said this. He said, man, I'm I'm not judging anything until that day. I don't even know really the motivation in my own heart. On that day, it's all going to be revealed. Jeremiah chapter 17 says, The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? And then the Bible says, I, the Lord, test the heart. I search the mind. What does that mean? Only the Lord knows. We need to be careful not to put ourselves in a position where we are uh, behaving like Satan and judging other people's motivations when we really don't know the motivations of our own heart. But Satan says this. He says, listen, the reality is Job just loves you because you're blessing him. God's response is, the Lord said to Satan, verse 12, behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. You may want to highlight that, underline that, reconsider it. Let me read it again. The Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. That heavy? Say, well, what in the world does that mean? It means that God will allow Satan to afflict our lives with restrictions. It means that God will allow Satan to afflict our lives with restrictions. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ tonight, no matter what you're going through, all of it, all of it. I'm not talking about foolish, sinful behavior and suffering the consequences of that. If you and I have been sinning, if we've been living unrighteously, you know, if we've been playing the fool and getting drunk and getting high and having sex outside of marriage and uh, being foolish with Uh, business and finances and making ungodly decisions, listen, we're going to reap what we sow. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the reality that in our lives, when we've done nothing wrong, the Lord will allow the enemy to afflict us with restrictions. Everything in our life, every single circumstance, every single situation, if we do truly believe that the Lord is sovereign over all things, 
everything in our life has been first filtered through the loving hands of God. The good things and the bad things. The easy things and the difficult things. The things that feel good to us and the things that are challenging. All of the financial blessings that we may have and yes, even the physical uh, tribulation, aff affliction, and sicknesses. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul was given a thorn in the flesh and it was, who was it? It was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet Paul to keep him in a place of humility. And this is the whole thing played out. He said to God three times, he said, relieve me from this thorn in the flesh. And God's response, if you remember, God's response to Paul was this, my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul's response to that was, you know what, I'm going to glory I'm going to boast in infirmities, in weaknesses, and in sicknesses because when I'm weak, the power of Christ rests upon me. God will allow his children to be afflicted by Satan. Remember, there's another circumstance that Jesus spoke of just before he was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember what he said to Peter? Do you remember? Well, he said a lot of things to Peter, didn't he? Do you remember when he said to Peter, Satan has sought to sift you as wheat? But he said to Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Jesus didn't say, hey, I prayed for you, and so you're going to experience no affliction. He didn't say, hey, I've prayed for you, and so difficulty and tribulation is not coming your way. He said to Peter, you know what? Satan wants to sift you. And you are going to go through a period of severe difficulty and spiritual conflict. But I've prayed for you that your faith may endure. God allows us to go through difficult circumstances not to undermine our faith, but to strengthen it. And certainly that was the plan of God in this situation. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now notice what happens in verse 13. There was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and a messenger came to Job and said the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. Remember, we're talking thousands of donkey and oxen. When the Sabians raided them and took them away, indeed, they've killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Certainly his head was spinning. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them all. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So think about this, right? God says, you know what? I'm going to allow you to afflict him, only preserve his person, preserve his physical body. You can lay your hand on his possessions. Satan leaves the presence of God and goes right for Job's throat, goes right for his possessions. And as Job is sitting there on this particular day, one of his servants comes to him and says, hey man, the Sabians came and they raided us. And all of the donkeys and all of the oxen that we had, they took all of them and all of your servants that were watching over those possessions They've been wiped out. They've been murdered. They've, they've all died. And I alone escaped to bring this message to you. While he's listening, another servant comes and he says, man, I've got really bad news. Uh, we were hanging out together and the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up all of your sheep and all of your servants. Imagine what this guy's going through. The fire of God fell. Now, you know, it's interesting to know, was this the fire of God? From the perspective of the messenger it was, but remember that this was an attack from Satan that was allowed by God. So, you know, when people say to you and to me, well, that was an, an act of God, a tornado sweeps through or an earthquake happens or, you know, some natural disaster happens, a lot of times God gets blamed for things that he didn't do. I think this was one of those circumstances. Fire from God fell and all of your sheep were all consumed and all of the servants were burnt up too. And while he's listening to this, verse 17, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So Job is listening, right? I mean, he's losing everything, all of his possessions. All of this probably happens with, within just a few minutes. While he's just beginning to process the fact that he's lost all of his sheep, fires fallen from heaven and consumed 
all of those servants, another servant comes and says the Chaldeans, who were a rugged group of people from the land of Ur at this time, around 2000 to 1500 BC, they were known for just uh, atrocities. Their raiding parties were renowned for how brutal they were. He said three bands of raiders came and they took all of the camels and then they slaughtered all of the servants and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he's processing this, the Bible says in verse 18, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people. And they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you this. In the original language, uh, there's certainly there are, there are four devastating things that happen to Job. They're, the first three are in three sentences. The last one is in eight sentences. And, and the picture is this, that all of Job's possessions, right, there's, it's almost, you know, a destructive climax here. All of his possessions are one by one being taken away. And then the most destructive thing, the most overwhelming thing, the saddest thing certainly for Job was to have that servant come and say, you know, your sons and your daughters were gathered and they were drinking wine, they were celebrating. And a wind from the south came and demolished the house and every single one of them have died. You know, there was a strategy in this. There was a satanic strategy. The devil had organized this. And, and his intention was this, that one by one, he would begin to chip away at Job. And the desire of his heart was to put Job in a position where he emotionally responded to God by cursing him. And so what does Satan do? One by one, he begins to unload these tragedies, and he, he brings the hardest, the most difficult, the most challenging trial at the very end almost like the climax, thinking in his mind that, man, once Job hears this, I mean, if, if you're thinking about this, and if this was you, you know that compared to everything else that's happened and that you've heard about previously, nothing compares to this last thing. He loved his kids. You know, he sacrificed for his kids. He interceded for his kids. He loved them. And, and then to hear in this climax, certainly the idea from the devil was this, that there is no way that Job is going to bless God. You know, some of us are in this place tonight, and, and, and when I say this to you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes it seems like in life everything happens at once. Sometimes, you know, when things get difficult in life, sometimes it feels like an avalanche, you know, almost like you can't even believe this has happened to you. Have you ever felt that way before? You know, where it's like, I can't even believe this is happening to me. And, you, you know, your thought is this, God, I can't handle one more thing, right? Maybe Job was thinking that just in the split second between these servants coming, you know, and, and certainly he would have seen just the, the sovereign strain in all of this one servant being spared you know, in each of these circumstances, but in that second in his mind thinking, God, I can't handle one more thing. You know, one more thing is going to break the camel's back. And then the worst thing happens. And Satan's desire is to do the very same thing in our life. To bring us to a place where there's difficulty after difficulty and his desire is to chip away. It's to wear away. It's to undermine your love relationship with the Lord, to put you in a position where you begin to question the character of God and where you begin to wonder about the plan of God for your life. And, and you can see, almost in a sneering sense, the anticipation of the serpent of old where you know what he was looking for, you know what he was waiting for, you know what he was wanting. He was thirsting to hear Job curse God to his face because I don't think... The devil even believed that someone could actually love God even if all of the possessions and the safety and even if his family was stripped away. 
there's this demonic anticipation. Satan has a strategy, and you need to be on guard. You need to be aware. The circumstances in your life, you need to recognize them for what they are. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Paul says, you know what, we're not unaware of the wiles or the strategies of the devil. And, that, and, and yet I want to say to you tonight, a lot of times, a lot of times it seems like we are willfully ignorant. You know, as much as we know about the Word of God, sometimes it seems like when we go through challenges and difficulty and when we're in the midst of spiritual combat and conflict, it almost seems like sometimes we willfully forget or we neglect the realization that we have an adversary, we have an opponent, and that his desire is to find a crack, a crevice, to undermine our faith, our faith relationship with God, and to, to diminish the glory that we give God in our life. What was Job's response going to be? Satan was stalking him, Satan was accusing him, now Satan's attacked him. All of his possessions have been taken away. I want you to notice how he responds. The Bible says in verse 20, Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. What does he do? Well, he, the Bible says, tears his robe and shaves his head. All right, I'm halfway there. All right, I don't have a robe to tear. But culturally, you know what this represented, right? This was an expression of grief. The Bible says he arose. Now, it may mean that Job at this point, right, hammer stroke after hammer stroke. The donkeys are gone, the sheep are gone, the camels are gone, the kids are gone. I mean, the guy's getting lower and lower and lower. He's broken. He's broken. And then at that servant's last words, when he hears that the kids are gone, he arises and he expresses, he expresses his anguish. He tears his robe. There's an expression of emotion here. It expresses his brokenness. It expresses the contrition of his heart. The Bible says he shaves his head, which was symbolic of losing the glory. A man's gray hair, the Bible says, is his glory, all right? Even if it just grows on the sides, like Bozo the Clown, doesn't matter, it's still his glory. But there was an expression here, not only was it an expression of contrition, he was acknowledging his personal loss. Listen, the next thing you expect to hear is for him to say something, to say something against God. The Bible says he falls on the ground and he worships. What strikes me is that Job's first reaction was not to say something. Job's first reaction was not to accuse God. Job's first reaction was not to question God. God's, his, Job's first reaction was not to charge God with wrong. What are you doing? I can't believe you've done this to me. You say you're a God of love and you're letting this happen in my life? That wasn't his first reaction. He genuinely expresses his emotion, not with words, but through the tearing of his robe and the shaving of his head. The Bible says he falls on his face and he worships. The word worship there means to humble yourself. It means to do obeisance. It means this picture of worship is when someone falls on the ground in humility, all right, this does not mean that Job broke out in song, you know, all to thee I surrender. Sometimes we have that idea that, you know, if we're real super spiritual, even when we go through difficult times, we're just going to break out in song. The guy wasn't breaking out in song, all right? He was broken, but he humbled himself, which signified his submission to the will of God. He humbled himself. And he signified his submission to the will of God by worshiping, by falling down. It was, listen, it was more than just this religious show. It was more than just putting on a facade. It was more than just acting outwardly like everything was right inwardly. He fell down and he humbled himself under the mighty hand of God. Someone said this, 
They said, we're to submit to trials not because we see the reasons for them, nor yet as, they, as though they were matters of chance, but because God wills them and has a right to send them and has his own good reasons in sending them. All right, we submit to trials not because we understand the purpose. I can say to you, hey, listen, God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And, and that's true. And that helps us to have an understanding of purpose in times of difficulty, all right? But when you're talking to someone that's just lost their child, you know, that's a, a challenging thing to say, hey, you know what? Buck up, brother. Buck up, sister. It's all going to be all right. God works all things together for good. You know, you're going to get four fingers in the face. Sometimes when you respond like that in, in just a, a contrite Christian saying to someone who's suffering, it's not just knowing that all things work together for good. It certainly isn't the idea that, you know, it is what it is. That's the modern philosophy of the day when you go through difficulties. Hey, bro, it is what it is. What does that mean anyway, right? I mean, is there any solace in that? Gee, thanks, man. Thanks for sharing that. That's just, it's brought me so much hope. You know, it, it is what it is. No, there's a, a, there's a more mature thing. There's a, a higher level of worship here. And that's submitting to trials because they're the will of God. And God has every right to bring them into our lives. And whatever his purpose is, oftentimes for us, you know what? We're not going to get to the bottom of it. We're not necessarily going to understand it. As a pastor, guys, I sit next to people who are suffering significantly, severely. And I, I don't always have the answers. I can't sit down with... Uh, mom and a dad whose child has just committed suicide and say to them, well, let me tell you why this happened. You know, and if I did, which I would never do, it would just make every word I share insignificant and insufficient and nothing but some trite Christian saying that's really meaningless. Oftentimes, in those times where we're supporting and strengthening someone who's suffering, it's just the quiet expression of love you know, it's the arm that goes around the shoulder. It's the prayer support that we bring. It's not always bringing what we believe to be the answer to someone's issue. Listen, we're going to see Job's counselors come, and they're all going to have an idea. They're all going to say, well, buddy, listen, this is why you're going through what you're going through. And guess what? They're all wrong. They were all wrong. They tried to put themselves off to be in the position of understanding why God was allowing suffering in Job's life, and the reality was this, they didn't know. And you know what? You don't know either all the time, and I don't as well. He humbles himself under the will of God, and listen, he says three things. Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return there, okay? This is a truth I want to help you hold on to tonight. When you were born, guess what? You were buck naked, okay? I mean, you were naked. You didn't come out in a tuxedo. You didn't come out with bling around your neck or on your rings. You didn't come out with any possessions. You didn't come out with a 401k. You came into the world naked. Guess what? When you leave, you ain't taking nothing with you, all right? No matter how much you might like it, no matter how hard you've worked for it. The old adage in our culture, the man or the woman who dies with the most toys in the end wins is obviously a bunch of nonsense. You see no U-Haul connected to hearse. Can't take it with you. you can, you're not going to show up in heaven and say, okay, God, how big is my mansion? Because I got a lot of stuff here. I, I worked really hard. And, uh, you know, I hope you got a lot of space because uh, it's moving in time. And by the way, you got some angels that can help me because we got a lot going on here. You're not taking anything with you. All right, there was, there was clarity. Job had clarity. He had common sense. Even in the midst of his suffering, my head would be spinning. Your head would be spinning. After suffering all of this, we would be spinning like this, and yet this man was so rooted and mature, he was able to have that sensible common sense where he realized, listen, the reality is I came in with nothing, I'm going to leave with nothing, listen, and then he says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. I came in with nothing, I'll leave with nothing, and everything in the middle is because of God anyway. God's given to me. And he's given to me freely. He's given to me richly. He's given to me graciously. God isn't given to me because I've earned it. God isn't given to me because I've merited it. God's just been good to me. God is good all the time. And guess what? Not only does he have the right to give, God has the right to take away. 
God has the right to, no, we're cool with the first part. God, listen, I just want to let you know tonight I'm cool with you giving, all right? You just open up the floodgates of heaven, Lord, and just let it pour out in Jesus' name. A blessing from God. I'm claiming all of those promises of the goodness and the gift of God, right? Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, right? Good, gift, perfect gift, just pour it out. But the alternative, we don't often find ourselves, ourselves saying, Lord, you know what? I just want you to strip away anything from my life that you don't want. It's a lot harder, isn't it? Things we've been clinging to, things we've been holding on to, things maybe, as the word says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, things in our life that have exalted themselves and have distracted us from serving and worshiping God completely, things that God has given to us. I'm not talking about evil things. I'm talking about the good gifts of God that we've begun to hoard, that we've begun to cling to, that we've begun to hold tight to. And God says, you know what I want you holding on to? I want you holding on to me. So why don't you release that? Come on. You ever play that game with your kids? Why don't you release that unto me? Oh, and there's that struggle. There's that battle. It goes back and forth. And God says, you know what? I love you so much. One finger at a time. You know, we can give to God either reluctantly or freely. I don't want God to have to pull something from my grip because I'm holding on to it so tightly. And listen, if I'm holding on to it tightly, it may mean that my desire for that thing has reached an unhealthy place for me spiritually. Maybe some of, of us in this room, we have a relationship. Maybe there's a, a relationship that we have I'm not talking about with your husband and wife. I'm talking about maybe you have a relationship outside of marriage and you're clinging to it. You're holding on to it. You won't let go of it. And God has been saying, you know what? This is not healthy. This is not healthy for you. It's not right for you. This is not strengthening you spiritually. It's time to release it. It's time to let it go. Maybe some of us have become so focused on our work, on our job, uh, that it's become unhealthy for us. And you know what? We're not being faithful to God. We're not being faithful to our families. We're not raising up our kids the way we should. And God says to us, listen, you need to reprioritize. You need to reorganize. We need to be in a place where, listen, we say, you know what, God? You give. You have the right to give. You've blessed me in giving. But I'm not holding on to anything except Jesus Christ. So, Lord, and my wife and my kids. So, Lord, take it away. Take away what, because some of you are thinking, yeah, I'll take, would you take my spouse away because this action isn't working for me anymore. Okay, no, he ain't going to do that, and don't even pray that, all right? May the Lord forgive you. But we've got to be in that place where we say, you know what, Lord, you give and you take away as well. And then he says this, blessed be the name of the Lord. The exact opposite of what Satan wanted to happen, happened. Satan's thinking he's going to curse him, he's going to curse him, and what does Job do? Job blesses the Lord. Blessed be your name. God, whether you give or whether you take away, whether you are pouring out abundantly or whether you are stripping, God, whether I'm abounding, like Paul said, or whether I'm abased, I find myself content in all things. Why? Because Jesus Christ is sufficient for me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God, if I'm poor and I have nothing, bless your name. God, if I'm rich, if I'm wealthy, bless your name. Lord God, if I've got health, physical health today, thank you so much, bless your name. God, if I'm struggling and there's physical affliction, bless your name. God, if my friends love me, if my friends are encouraging to me, bless your name. God, if my friends are betraying me and misusing me, bless your name. God, if my ministry is fruitful and growing and multiplying, bless your name. God, if my ministry is, is struggling and I don't see a lot of fruit, search my heart. And if this is your will, bless your name. God, if you're going to bless us with kids, if you're going to allow us to have kids, husband and wife, through natural process, bless your name. God, if you're not and you're going to give us the opportunity to adopt kids, bless your name. 
in all things, right? In all things, bless your name. When we worship God, the most significant worship in our lives does not come when we are abounding in blessing. It comes when we are distressed by trials. It comes when those times God has allowed things to be stripped away and the motivation of our heart is revealed. And in the midst of our own real agony, pain, and suffering, right? In the, in the midst of our own valley of the shadow of death, which is real and tangible and true. Real worship comes when in those times we can say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, we love you. We want to thank you for your word tonight. And God, we pray that this would be true of us. We pray, God, that this would be real in us, that we would be Children who bless your name. Who have this trust and faith regardless of the difficult circumstances that we may find ourselves in. Tonight, as a congregation, and it, it may come out of real anguish tonight. It may come, Lord, as a real work and effort, it takes effort tonight just to lift this phrase up to you because we feel so overwhelmed, God, so burdened, almost like the challenges in life have come as a flood and are overwhelming us. But yet, in all of this, we say to you, God, tonight, because we love you, because we trust you, because we know, God, that you have the right to do whatever you desire in our lives and that your will is always good, we say to you tonight, blessed be the name of the Lord. Receive our praise this evening and guard our hearts from charging you with wrong in our lives. I pray tonight, God, that you just would be merciful mercifully move among us and for those who are truly struggling tonight god that they would sense and experience the strength of your love lifting them up tonight as our eyes are closed and as our heads are bowed i've got a, a glorious truth to tell you tonight god loves you so much and god loved you so much that he sent his only son jesus christ to die on the cross for you so that you could be forgiven of your sins, that you could be saved and redeemed and be made a child of God, that you could have everlasting life. And tonight you can experience the forgiveness of sins. You can experience the work of God's Holy Spirit in your life tonight simply by putting your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe the circumstances you're going through have been intended by God to bring you, in fact, to this point, the point of faith, the point of trust in Him, bringing you to that point where you humble yourself before Him. Tonight, if this is you and you'd say, Pastor, that's me. I need the Lord Jesus in my life. I need the forgiveness of sins. I want to take this step of faith and receive the gift of God tonight. If this is you, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer this evening. Tonight, as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, this is you. This is your prayer to God. God hears you tonight. Respond to him and how he's been speaking to you and receive his gift this evening. I'll pray slowly. Follow me in prayer. God, tonight, God, I confess I've sinned against you. God, you see all things, you know I've sinned, and tonight I'm turning away from my sin, and I'm believing in Jesus, your son, believing that he died on the cross for my sin, that he was dead and buried and rose again on the third day. And I believe tonight that through faith in him, as I've received him and trusted in him, I believe you've forgiven me. I believe that I'm your child. And I believe that tonight 
You've given me the gift of everlasting life. God, I love you. And I thank you, God, for loving me. In Jesus' name I pray.